Praise the Lord. I welcome you back from the Ghana GCK and I believe that the Lord bless you tremendously, abundantly as He blessed us there in Jesus' name. Really, really, did the Lord bless you? Where are you? The blessing, the permanent in Jesus' name. Since we came back from Accra, Ghana, We've been hearing spectacular, spectacular testimonies. <laughs> Apart from what happened at the crusade field, a lot of things happened. And their testimonies, their miracles, spontaneous. Not wait, God is coming. God was there. And he was there promptly to bless the people and to break every chain and to destroy all the works of the devil. Then, the people did uh, something they no, don't normally do in other places. After we had finished and we came back, they were to leave very early because of the flight. And as we came to the airport, uh, some of the people, uh, the security person told me, some people are here to see you for prayer. I thought we had done all the prayer at the crusade field. And then they brought, I said, uh, just, we don't have much time. They said it'll be very quick. And they brought them in batches, this batch and this batch and this batch. I was only inside my heart. When are these people going to finish? They want us to start another crusade here. And then they brought them in batches. And all those batches were prayed, were prayed, were prayed. I mean, I prayed. Um, and then uh, this particular batch, almost the last one, they brought this child. And the child could not walk, could not talk. Don't act as if you have heard, because I know you've seen it online. <laughs> and, and then we prayed. And so I said, God bless you. And, and, and they didn't have time to touch the people. They just stayed there. You know, like we used to do at Bagada after the service. I'm recording this right now. Well, well, you know, stay there. And they say some people need, I say, stay there. And then I come, and then I pray for them, and then I go. And some people will stay there, and still they're crying. I see, touch me, touch me, pray for me. But over there, we just prayed. And then they went out, and they were, as they were going out, this child that had cerebral problem, brain problem, and also that had speech problem, and could not uh, walk, and they got outside, still in the airport, the miracle happened. And, um, and so the mother was so excited, rolling on the ground. And then they came to tell me, was still there in Ghana, they came to tell me there is a commotion or chaos outside because, you know, airport people and all that, they joined them and they were watching a great miracle. It will happen in your life. And then, and then, we now came back here and somebody sent a message yesterday and said that uh, there was another one that had real, I think the bone was broken, or, oh, sorry, did it have bone in the leg, rubber, flesh, and they called yesterday, they sent yesterday to say bone has come back to that leg. And then another one, mental, having mental problem. Actually, the wife of a pastor, a leader, mental problem. And they came to the airport too. And by the grace of God now, we are told that what she wasn't able to do before, household things and everything, talking, everything normal, miracle upon your life 
And so the message today is not going to be based on the Exodus we studied. We're making a special study of believers, praiseworthy pursuit after God's glorious visitation. We're celebrating God's glorious visitation upon your life, upon my life, upon our church, everywhere in Jesus' name. You must have today, you must have the foretaste of your own visitation. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you and bless your name. We glorify you because we know you're a good God, a loving God, a compassionate God, a merciful God. How great, how good, how compassionate you are. And we're praying today that your blessing will flow into everybody's life in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, you put a testimony and put joy in every heart in Jesus' name. Manifest yourself to the people here, to the people there, online, everywhere today in Jesus' name. Be glorified in every child. Be glorified in every teenager. Be glorified in the youth and the college people. Be glorified in everyone here, papas and mamas and adults and everybody in Jesus' name. And our fellow worshippers who are joining us online, Lord, I pray your blessing and the avalanche of miracles will come upon them too in Jesus' name. Confirm your word in every life. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. And see now we're looking at Psalm 106. Psalm 106, and I'm reading from verse 1. Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? Verse 3, in verse 3, blessed are they that keep his judgment and he that doeth righteousness at all times. And then he tells us in verse 4, it says, Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. Oh, visit me. Say that. Say that again. Oh, visit me with thy salvation. And then in verse 5, that I may see the good of thy choosing, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thine inheritance. Verse 47, in verse 47, save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. Verse 48, blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The believers praise worthy pursuits after God's glorious visitation. That now that God has visited us, watch do we pursue? What do we do? How do we respond to the Lord, connect with the Lord, and abide in the Lord after such a wonderful, glorious visitation? We're looking at three points here. Number one, the, walk, the walking of wonders at his faithful, gracious visitation. The walking of wonders at his faithful, gracious visitation. Number two, is warning for wondrous after his favorable, great visitation. Number three, wisdom 
of waiting for his final glorious visitation. We're looking at number one. Number one is the walking of wonders at his faithful, gracious visitation. The walking of wonders at the point of his gracious visitation. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, number one, the prayer for his gracious visitation. Number two, is the purpose of his granted visitation. Number three, is the praise for his good visitation. Look at number one. Number one is the prayer for his gracious visitation. We're looking at verse four of that Psalm 106. Remember me, O Lord. Isn't that a good prayer? Whatever situation you are in, you are now a child of God. You have repented. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You are born again. You are saved. Your name is written in the book of life and you are in good standing, in good standing with the Lord. He looks at you and says, that's my daughter, that's my son. You look at him and you say, that's my father, heavenly father. And because you're in a good stage, you're in a good standing and you're in the salvation of the Lord. You can easily say, remember me, O Lord, with thy of the favor that Thou bearest unto thy people, O visit me with thy salvation. But already you are saved. Yes, you are saved with thy salvation, with thy redemption, with thy righteousness, with thy goodness, with thy grace, with heavenly blessing upon my life. Visit me with thy salvation. We're looking at Luke chapter 1 and verse 68. Luke chapter 1 verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. When he visits us, he doesn't come empty-handed. He visits us with redemption. He visits us with his mercy and with his his compassion. He visits us with the blessing we need at that moment, at that hour, and everything comes from the redemption of Christ. It comes from all he had paid for. Everything he had done at Calvary. It says in verse 69, it says, and as raised up and horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, verse 14, uh, Acts 15, 14, Simon has declared now how God did visit the Gentiles. He's talking about the experience of, uh, of Peter, the apostle, in the house of Cornelius. The Lord sent, Cornelius, sent Peter there, and as Peter got there, he gave them the word. It is a great visitation when God gives us his word, when he visits us. Not only that, they were saved. Salvation, redemption, forgiveness, freedom came with the visitation of the Lord in the house of Cornelius. They were purified, purifying them by faith. They were purified and sanctified. God's visitation brings salvation brings redemption and it brings the purity of heart holiness it brings sanctification and then they were filled with the house uh, with the uh, spirit of god in the house of cornelius you know the story how the spirit of god came upon them and they began to speak in tongues and the spirit gave utterance i'm saying that when god visits us salvation comes sanctification comes and the baptism in the Holy Ghost also comes healing, deliverance everything connected with total redemption for your spirit for your soul, for your body everything comes, Simon has declared how God at the force did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, Psalm 119, in Psalm 119, reading from verse 32, look thou upon me, upon me, and be merciful unto me, as thou usest to 
you unto those that love thy name. 133, in 133 it says, Order my steps in thy word. Let not iniquity have dominion over me. When he visits us and we need power, we need authority to overcome all the iniquities on earth, all the transgressions on earth, all our past failures in the past. We need power to overcome. We need power to be able to trample over and triumph over all the things that put us in the dungeon, in the dark, in the dirt, and in evil, in defilement before now he has visited us. And he comes and he says, tell me like he told Solomon, what do you want me to do unto you? And then we we'll say that we might have the victory over our iniquities, over, over our transgressions, and over our infirmities and everything that are trampled upon us before. When we we'll say we need the power, the victory, the triumph over them, it may be besetting sin. It may be those uh, heavy ways that you carry along. It may be the peculiar thing you always fall into, fall into. And if you keep on falling into that, you will not make it in eternity. And now Christ is visiting. Now the Lord is visiting. You say, help me and let not iniquity, any form of iniquity, have any dominion on me. That's our prayer, and God will answer every prayer we pray in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two here is the purpose of his granted visitation. He grants us our request. Oh Lord, visit me. And as he grants us that request, what does he do and why does he do it? The purpose of his granted visitation. We're looking at Psalm 106, reading from verse 3. In Psalm 106, verse 3, blessed are they that keep judgment and he that doeth righteousness at all times. You know, religious people, they, they try to be sober, serious, holy, no drinking, no evil thing on Sunday or on special days. But now, they summit, knowing that when God visits us, he wants us righteous all the time. And now that he visits us, we ask for the grace and we ask for the strength. We ask for the power to be righteous, to do righteousness at all times, every day, Sunday or Monday. Every day, weekday or sunny day, every day, the day of adversity or the day of persecution or the any time, every, every time, our prayer is that the Lord who has saved us will give us the continual constant power and constant strength and constant conviction to live righteously. He says in the, the purpose of the, of the visitation is that he would do righteousness at all times. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says that I may see the good of thy chosen. He chose Abraham. And the goodness that was revealed in the life of chosen Abraham, that I may see that he chose Moses, the goodness, the power, the strength, the authority, and the abiding virtue that he gave to Moses, that I may see the good of thy chosen. He chose Joshua, and then Joshua had all the power, everything that you know that he needed, even the power to stop the sun, that everything I need for my life, for my family, and for my ministry, that everything will be done, to, that I may see the goodness and the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thine 
inheritance. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. We are told in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, don't open. I just tell you, it says, Rejoice, as I say unto you, rejoice. Why? Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, the joy of the Lord is our strength. I said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Look at the other side of that coin. The sorrow of the world is our weakness. When you hear news from the world and you're shifted away from the joy of the Lord, the news, bad news, their plan, bad plan, their kind of activities, bad activities, you hear them, you read them, the sorrow of the world is a weakness. But when you always abide in the joy of the Lord, in the promises of the Lord, in the goodness of the Lord, what he does, what he does for you, what he does for other people, and he's an impartial God, what he's done for you, will, for others, it will do for you, and then you have the joy, the joy, the joy, the joy that the Lord has come. He has come to visit you. He has come to look at your predicaments. He has come to bring full redemption unto you. The joy of the Lord is your strength. But if you are thinking of the sorrow of the world, you'll not be able to sleep. The sorrow of the world, it will weaken you, destabilize you. It will make you sick, sick in your mind and sick in your body. But here it says, I want your visitation. And the purpose, I want your visitation is that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thine inheritance. We're looking at uh, Luke again. We're looking at Luke now, chapter 1, verse 68. The purpose of his granted visitation. In Luke chapter 1, verse 68, blessed are is be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. 69, in 69, and he has restored and horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Verse 70, in verse 70, as he speak by the mouth of his holy prophets, he said he was coming, he said he will send our Redeemer, our Savior, our Messiah. He said they will send the one that will reveal and show all his mind unto us. And now he has done it as he spoke. Everything he does as he spoke. And he has spoken quite a lot. I will heal. I will deliver. I will set free. I will make you strong as your days. So shall your strength be. And as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. 71, in 71, that we should be saved from our enemies. I did hear your amen. Why don't we accomplish what the Lord sent us on earth to do? Our fear of our enemies. They won't let me do it. They'll double cross my way. They'll crush me. They'll spoil the plan. And we fear those enemies who don't even want to come out of their house. But you know, already he has sent our Redeemer. You have, I have, we have a divine visitation. And we will be saved from all our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. You know what those um, followers of Satan, what they do? They want to show and they want to tell you, you're so free, you're so happy, you're so joyful. Okay, understand. We are here and we are your enemies. We hate you. And the way the human mind works, ordinary man, you'll be thinking of, they hate me. They hate me. If you want to plan, they hate me. If you want to jump, they hate me. If you want to run, ah, be careful, they hate me. And your mind, 
your heart, your thoughts is taken up with the hate me. They're my enemies. They won't allow me to fly. And the Lord says, what are you thinking like that? What are you talking like that? Because now he has visited us and the purpose of his visitation is that he shall save us from our enemies. We understand? Save us from sin. That one we understand. Save us from fear. Save us from enemies and save us from all that hate us. You are totally, fully, completely, comprehensively saved in Jesus' name. Look at verse 72. In verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Look at verse 73. It says the oath which is swear to our father Abraham. Verse 74, that he would grant us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him. Tell me. Let me ask you. Is there any full day, morning till evening till night, till the following morning, 24 hours, is there any full day you are free from fear? The fear of the past running after us, what will happen? The fear of the present goading us, challenging us, pinching us, are you free? The fear of the future, what will happen? What may happen? The dreams, what the dreams say. Are you free? Free from the fear. It says that we might serve you without fear. I'm going to the office. I know the thing I will meet there. Fear. I'm going back to the house. The challenges I'll meet there. The confusion, commotion I will meet there. Fear. I'm going to the church. We're going to worship the Lord. Am I free from fear going to church? Or am I, I walk carefully, I'll hide my blessing, I'll hide my joy. Because even in church, I fear this, I fear that. But the purpose of the visitation is that he will deliver you out of the hand of our enemies that we might serve him without fear no fear in church no fear at home no fear in your community whatever anybody is planning there is somebody higher than the highest that is planning for you and then it says in verse 75, it says in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Your time for joy, constant joy, happiness, no fear anywhere, anytime for anything, that time has now come. But looking at First John, the purpose of the granted visitation. We're looking at First John chapter 2, reading from verse 28. And now, little children, don't mind little children, is every one of us little children, to John the aged, who is about 96 years of age, at that time all of us little children abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. The reason he's come to visit us is so that he'll so prepare us that when he comes, there'll be no fear of being left out. In chapter 3, oh, sorry, verse 29, verse 29, if we know that he is righteous, we know, ye know that everyone that 
doeth righteousness is born of him. And now chapter 3 verse 7. In chapter 3 verse 7, the purpose of his granted visitation. Chapter 3 verse 7, little children, let no man deceive you. Deception brings unnecessary self-imposed danger. When people, when they tell you something and they deceive you, they bring danger in your life. When their actions deceive you, when you are surrounded by liars and deceivers and you depend upon their word and you depend upon their actions, it deceives you and you bring unnecessary problem on yourself because you run in the direction of the deceiver. They tell you this, 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 and then you pick up your baggage, you run out of your home, you run out of your ministry, you run out of your calling. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil. Give me a good amen. amen. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The visitation that he has granted us is so that the work on the cross at Calvary will destroy all the works of the devil. How am I a Christian for 10 years and all those works of the devil are more prominent than the wonders of the Lord in my life. How am I a Christian for 20 years, 25 years, 50 years, 60 years. And yet, the works of the devil are more prominent. The thoughts of the devil, the work of the devil, the plan of the devil, the pressure of the devil, the fear of the devil is still more prominent than, you know, even at the time we knew the Lord. What's happening there? We must understand that the purpose of Christ coming, coming to the world, coming on the cross, coming in our hearts, in my heart. The purpose of God sending Christ to me is so that the fear of the past and the fear of the devil will totally be forgotten in your life in Jesus' name. It says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for he, for the seed remaineth, abideth in him, and he cannot sin. He cannot sin because he is born of God. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, in this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil, whosoever, whosoever, whatever his title, whatever his position, whatever his calling, whatever his popularity, whatever he owns, whatever he has, whatever might make him proud. I am this, I am that. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not is brother. Give me a good amen. Our actions make us know. Our activities make us known. Anything we do that lacks love, lacks forgiveness, like we had at yesterday's uh, workers' uh, meeting, that we cannot be like God, that sends rain and sunshine upon the just and the unjust. Everything that holds 
this uh, partial thing, I like that, I don't like that. I appreciate that, I don't appreciate that. And we live with the idea of evil, of forgiveness, envy, jealousy, and we have hatred in our heart. It shows whoever we are, we are not the children of God. In this, the children of God are manifest. And the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness, is not of God, neither he that loveth, neither he that loveth not his brother. We're coming to number three here. Number three here is the praise for his good visitation. It's praise for his good visitation. In Psalm 106, we're reading from verse 1. It says, Praise ye the Lord, who give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. What do we perceive? He is good. Good enough to save us, good enough to forgive us, good enough to turn our lives around. For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. I thought somebody would say, Amen. Amen. Forever has not ended. It was good and merciful at that time. And on and on, and Jesus has come. And on and on, and Jesus has died for us. And on and on, and Jesus rose again. And on and on, he's gone to heaven. He's standing for us there. He's our intercessor there. And forever has not ended. Even till today, he is good and merciful. Today, tomorrow, for the rest of our lives, the goodness of the Lord will never stop in your life. Because it endure it forever. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can enumerate, utter, describe, least to completion? Who can enumerate or utter the goodness of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise. We're looking at verse 8. In verse 8 it says, nevertheless he saved them for his name's sake. He saved me for his name's sake. He was thinking about himself. Salvation of this man will bring glory to me. The salvation of that woman will bring glory to me for his name's sake that he might make his mighty power to be known. That's why you came into the kingdom. Through you he'll make his mighty power to be known in Jesus name. Look at verse 9. In verse 9 he rebuked the Red Sea also and it was dried up so he led them through the depths as though the wilderness. Verse 10, in verse 10, he saved them from the hand of him that hated them. Saved them from the hands of the one that hated them. You know, sometimes when you are handled, rough handled man handled and they handle you to make you almost despair of life you say is this how life is going to continue forever is this how pressure persecution difficulty is going to continue forever is this how i am going to be in the hand of the people that will want to squeeze life joy out of me no you will not continue like that the people that would like to squeeze life joy happiness out of you is going to save you out of their hands 
He says, he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. In verse 11, verse 11 says, and the waters covered their enemies and there was not one of them left. Already it has happened to the children of Israel. And those children of Israel, they have gone. Why is he writing this for us? He's saying, this is what he did for your senior brothers and senior sisters up there yonder. Exactly what he did for them, he will do for you. Because the waters covered their enemies and there was none, not one of them left. In verse 12, it says, they believed. Then believed they his works and they sang his praise. You will sing his praise. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, nevertheless, he regarded their affliction. And when he heard their cry, he heard their cry. Ah, what are the people crying there? The people you saved. The people you redeemed, we came into another predicament. Nevertheless, he regarded the affliction when he heard their cry. Verse 45, in verse 45, and he remembered, he remembered for them his covenant. He will always remember you. And he repented according to the multitude of his mercies. Verse 46, in verse 46, he made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them captive. Verse 47, in verse 47, save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to and to triumph in thy praise. Verse 48. In verse 48 it says, Blessed be the Lord God of history from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise ye the Lord. A good day has come for you. A good time, a good year, a good period has come for you in Jesus' name. Many might be the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will save the righteous from them all. Salvation you have got. For the salvation you will have. Full salvation you will have. And a favorable salvation you will have. And the final salvation you will have in your life, in your family. Comprehensive, complete salvation for spirit, soul, and body. In every area of your life, the Lord confirmed that in your life in Jesus. We're looking at number two now. Number two, we're looking at the one, his warning for wondrous after his favorable, great visitation. You see the children of Israel? After having the great visitation of the Lord, the story is repeated here in Psalm 100 and sees that instead of continuing with the Lord, abiding with the Lord, staying with the Lord, instead of continuing in his great visitation, many of them diverted here, diverted there, went the other way. And God is using their story to warn us, it's warning in from wondrous after his favorable great visitation. We're dividing this to three parts. Number one, the corrupted way of wondrous in the wilderness. Even in the wilderness, they started all that meandering and wandering away from the truth and from the greatness of God. Number two, constant 
warning for the wise in his word. In the word of God, the Lord gives us warning from Genesis to Revelation. Warning, warning. You said, I didn't see that in Genesis. Look not behind you. Go straight to the mountain top. Because if you look back, this is what will happen. That's Genesis, that's one revelation. And you want that will take out of this word or add to this word of prophecy. The Lord shall add unto him the plagues therein and will take his name out of the book of life. From, from Genesis, revelation, warning, warning for the wise in his word. Number three, the conquering weapon of warfare against worldliness. Worldliness. Now, worldliness is not just pinching the leaves or having something in the ear or hanging something on the neck. The ideas of the world, the pollutions of the world, the practices of the world, the festivals of the world, the, the music of the world, the dancing of the world, and the mindset of the world. Everything is worldliness. And now we have the conquering weapon of warfare against worldliness. Look at number one there. Number one is the corrupted way of wondrous in the wilderness. We're looking at Psalm 106, verse 13. Psalm 106, verse 13. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. All those people that received the great miracle in Egypt and the great miracle at the Red Sea and the great miracle of water out of the rock and the great miracle of manna every day, they soon forgot his works. And they waited not for his counsel. Impatience overwhelmed them. And they wanted to run and run, and they didn't wait for thus says the Lord. Like many people today, they do not wait for what does the Lord say in his word. They do not wait for what is the Spirit saying now. They go into self-management. And they do not wait for, this is what God wants done. And they do not question themselves, this step I'm taking. This place I'm going. This thing I want to do. This marriage I want to get into. The flesh is pushing them, pushing them. They cannot wait. And men who counsel them, women who counsel them, ask them. Did they pray? Did they hear from the Lord? They go from past experience. So and so came to me for counseling at the time of his marriage, her marriage. This is what I said. Hold on. What you said, check up the results. If the fellow crying in that marriage now, if the, is the fellow regretting, in that marriage now this is what I said and then they say the same thing to the same pe to different people about the same matter the counselees the counselors they do not wait for his counsel they deviated and derailed and went away from the path they need to get into. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, but they lost it exceedingly in the wilderness and they tempted God in the desert. Verse 15, in verse 15, he gave them their request. He gave them their request. Why? Because they pushed him aside. Give me. Get me. Show me. I must have this now. My flesh is pushing me. And my flesh say, if I don't have it now, I will not be at rest. So, do this for me now. They didn't say if it be thy will, 
If you want us to have this, look, it's giving you manna every day already. It's turning your bitter water to drinkable water. It's overcoming all the Amalekites. Why can't you go to him? Why do you take gloss into your hand? What you think your life in your hand? That's what he did. And so he gave them their request, but he sent leanness into their soul. Now you've got what your precious God to give you, but there's leanness in your soul. There's famine in your soul. There's regret in your life. There is pain. And also, you're confused, and the way sanctification is gone, power of the Holy Ghost gone, and the power to pray gone, you are now empty and shallow. Because you wanted to have your way. Why don't you come back and say, I will not wander in the way of the wanderers. I will not go astray with self-management. And then we look at um, someone Seven. In Psalm 107, verse 4, it tells us here, it says, They wandered in the wilderness. In a solitary way, they found no city to dwell in. Look at these people. The pillar of cloud was there by day. The pillar of fire was there by night. And the word tells us it to search out a place for them. A place of rest, a place of refuge, a place of total restoration to what God had promised Abraham. The pillar of cloud was there, the pillar of fire was there, but they neglected all that and they wanted to uh, pave their own way. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Are we like that? The Lord says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will go before you. I will come behind you. I will surround you. And underneath you will be the everlasting arms. And yet, we're looking around. We don't know where to go. We're confused because we have not remained. and We have not abode in the place where God wants us to go. And it says they wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. And they found no city to dwell in. I pray the Lord will turn everything around. We're coming to number two. Number two here is a constant warning for the wise in his word. The fool doesn't want any warning. The fool rejects every form of warning. There's a ditch there. So leave me alone. They fall into the ditch. There are dangers in front of you. Do not bother my life. And they fall into the danger. Those are the foolish people. They close their eyes when you ought to be opening their eyes. And they open their eyes in anxiety and worry when they ought to close their eyes and sleep. But the wise, the wise are the people that say God knows more and better than me. The word of God knows better and more than me. But they will not open the word and reach the word. They are fools. But the wise who know the supremacy of the almighty God. And the wise who know the greatness of the counsel of the word. They are the people that open the world. Speak to me, Lord. Teach me, Lord. Show me the way I ought to go. We have warning and we heed the warning. Acts chapter 20, reading from verse 26. In Acts chapter 20, verse 26, here is what it tells us. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Look at verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. 
all the counsel of God. Can't we say the same thing here? When we listen to recorded messages and uh, we hear what materials are there, how we see truly this church has preached on almost every subject you can find that you need and it's been revealed to us. Those things are there online. They're there in the YouTube. They're there from, you know, the media section. Why can't we get them knowing that whatever counsel we need, whatever exhortation we need, whatever warning we need, and whatever encouragement and faith we need, it's all there revealed and recorded for us. And Paul the Apostle said, For I am not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Verse 28. In verse 28, it tells us, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. That's what we do here. To feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Verse 29. In verse 29, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Verse 30, in verse 30, it says, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, opposing the word they have heard, speaking perverse things, contradicting the doctrine of salvation, holiness, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism, contradicting and opposing the word of marriage, one man, one wife, opposing the word of living in holiness and righteousness every day, all the days of our lives of your own selves, people you know, people who are near, people who claim to be preachers and counselors and leaders and significant workers in our church. Of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. They're drawing away from Christ. They're drawing those disciples away from the Lord who saved us and redeemed us. And then in verse 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn you. Every man, I cease not to warn every man night and days with tears. That's what the Lord is reminding us of. We give warning to the people. You receive the warning and then you come out of self-management living without the word and living without the Lord. We're coming to number three here. Number three the conquering weapon of warfare against worldliness. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're reading from verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. The weapons we have they are not carnal, they are not human, they are not natural, they are not fleshly. The weapons we have, they are not of, you know, the weapons the people of the world are using. You know, the people of the world, they have their own weapons. What's the weapon? Uh, sometimes it's the weapon of violence. You read in the papers, you see on your streets that the weapon, the weapon of violence. It says our own weapon, they are not like that. Of violence. The weapons of the world is the weapon of intimidation. Everybody has right to go this way, line up there and, you know, put what you want to put. And then you line up there and this is what you want to put. But they intimidate these people here so that they even be afraid to get to the people place they are going to drop anything. The weapon of each intimidation. That's the weapon of the world. That's what is called carnal weapon. And we who are children of God, he says, 
If we use those carnal weapons, we don't belong to God. If we use the weapon of intimidation, we don't belong to God. But the weapons we have, my brother, why would you want to intimidate your wife to bring down that subjection? Two shall be one. What you want to do, you want others to do to you, you do to them. Would you want anyone running after you at home? It immediate you in church, it immediate you on the streets. It immediate you in the office. It immediate you like a network of intimidators. That's not godly weapon. If we're using that, we're using carnal weapons. That in a conspiracy everywhere, at every point, we're now to intimidate a particular person. And you want the person to be his best. You want him to be able to deliver on that, that system of intimidation. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapon of deception, that's what they do in the world. The world will, you know, say something to you and tell you, I'll see you there. And where they want to see you, actually, they are not there. And then you take the whole day, waste your life, waste your time, because somebody sent you something, and you have to be there. That kind of weapon of deception. Christians don't do that. We love our neighbor. We want them to be happy. We want them to have progress. We don't want them to have anxiety or any kind of worry. But... The so-called Christians of today, they look at the weapons the world is using, weapons of the flesh and weapons of the world. And they, you know, they try to gorge their captives. But it says when we're Christians or children of God, and we know that the Lord has visited us, visited us with blessing. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strong holes. The weapon of prayer, the weapon of intercession, the weapon of trust in God, the weapon of faith in God. We so trust Him and all our problems are solved by Him. Then He tells us in verse 5, it says, casting down imaginations and every high sin that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. We're coming to uh, point number three. In point number three, we're looking at the wisdom for waiting for his final glorious visitation. He has given us visitation. He redeemed us. He saved us. He delivered us. He saved us from all the things that would have crushed our lives, squeezed our lives. He's giving us redemption from that. And now there's the final visitation, a glorious visitation when Christ will come. And when Christ comes, it take us to his home. It'll take you to his home. It'll take me to his home. And all of us, as we believe in him and follow him and trust him, there is the final glorious visitation, the wisdom of waiting for his glorious visitation. We're coming to Psalm 106, and we're reading from verse 24. Yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word. The Lord had visited them in Egypt. He's going through with them in the wilderness and he wants to take them to the pleasant land, the promised land, the perfect land. But they despised the pleasant land 
and they believed not his word. Their minds were always going to Egypt. Oh, the concubines were etched in Egypt. And the pomegranate and the melon and everything were etched in Egypt. The mind never left Egypt. They were not thinking of the pleasant land. But the Lord wants to take us to the promised land, the pleasant land, the perfect land. He wants us to, he wants to take us to heaven. And he wants us to have the wisdom of waiting for his final glorious visitation. It says, they despised the pleasant land and they believed not his word. We're looking at this under three perspectives. Number one, number one, desiring, not despising the pleasant land. Number two, declaring, not depreciating the promised land. Number three, drawing near, not departing from our perfect Lord. We're looking at number one. Number one, we're looking at desiring, not despising the pleasant land. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, reading from verse 3, it says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. That's the pleasant land. He wanted them to be there. And he wanted them to remain and abide there. In Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 13. Hebrews chapter 11, we're looking at verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. It's talking about Abraham and Sarah. They believed in that pleasant land. But they didn't physically reach there. But they died in faith. They were going to a better country. He's talking about Isaac. He's talking about Jacob. They died before the children of Israel got to the land of Canaan, the pleasant land. But they believed a better land was waiting for them. He's talking about uh, people like uh, Moses and Aaron and Miriam. They didn't actually get physically into the promised pleasant land, but they believed a better land waiting for them. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. In verse 15, verse 15 says, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have a return. But then in verse 16, verse 16 says, and but now they desire a better country. That is, and heavenly there wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city the Lord is telling us well, we need to look at the pleasant land and desire the pleasant land and desire what he has prepared for us in the future and not have our minds glued to the things here on earth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 18. It tells us here, while we look not at the things which are seen, the things we see, a house, a cars, our landed property, and all the things that are tangible, all the things that are touchable, all the things that give us satisfaction, fulfillment, yeah, all those things are temporary. 
they're going to pass away or we are going to pass away and leave the house behind and leave all the cars behind it says while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen the pleasant land the perfect land heaven the better country, the place Christ has gone to prepare for us are the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Well, coming to number two there, number two there is declaring, not depreciating, the promised land. Hebrews again, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 14. Hebrews 11 verse 14, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Verse 15, verse 15, and truly, truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Think about Abraham. Abraham left the Chaldeans, and the Lord brought him to a new place and he never had an idea within him. I want to go back to where I came from. Even when the son was going to get married, Isaac, he told the chief of his servants, he said, don't take my son back there to where I came from. He didn't want to have the challenge of even going back there to pay dowry, to do anything for himself, for Sarah, or for his sake. He already blocked his mind from where he came from, the better country, the place God had provided for him, that the place he wanted. And think of Moses. Moses never had the idea, I'll go back to Egypt and be, not be able to make uh, something better there. The, the trouble of these uh, Israelites, the trouble is too much. No water, no water. They'd be almost ready to stone them. And no food. All this manna is this is what we are going to sit down for. And the, all the challenges that Moses had in the wilderness, he never had a mind he was going back to Egypt. And that's why the people of God, even, Je, even Joseph said, as you are leaving, because the Lord will visit you, and he will take you out of this place to the promised land. Even my bones that are here, you scoop everything and gather everything together and take me to that land where the Lord had promised is telling us that we as children of God we declare, we do not depreciate and we desire, we do not depreciate the promised land. Look at verse 16. Verse 16 tells us, it says, but now the desire a better country that is an heavenly heavenly wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city yes he has prepared for you a heavenly city uh, look at chapter 13 I'm reading from verse 12. In chapter 13, verse 12, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Verse 13, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Verse 14. In verse 14, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We seek one to come. Second Corinthians chapter 5. In Second Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 1, for we know that if our earthly house and body of this tabernacle be dissolved. We have a building of God, 
and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, in verse 2. It says, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be closed upon with our house which is from heaven. Verse 3, in verse 3 it says, if so be that being closed we shall not be found naked. Verse 4, in verse 4 it says, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, we desire, we groan. Being bodied, not for that we would be unclothed, but closed upon that mortality might swallow up, might be swallowed up of life. Verse 5. In verse 5, but now he that has wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also has given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Verse 6. In verse 6, it says, Wherefore, we're always confident, knowing that once we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Verse 7, verse 7, for we we'll walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 8, in verse 8, and we're confident, I say, I'm willing rather to be absent from the body, that is our spirit, our soul, getting out of the body, and we leave the body down here, absent from the body, and to be present with the Lord. That's talking about the Lord coming for us. That's talking about even those who died, their spirit, their soul, go back unto God and the body back to the door. See, Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 23, for I am in a strange betwixt you, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. The moment a child of God dies, the spirit, the soul, the inner man goes to be with the Lord immediately. And Paul the apostle said that is far better. And then when the rapture happens, of course, and it comes, and the believers, the saints uh, are resurrected, and they are taken up, and, and then we which are alive, we're caught up to be with the Lord. What a glorious event and a glorious uh, situation that will be. We're coming to number three here. Number three is drawing nearer and nearer and nearer to the Lord, the perfect Lord, not departing from our perfect Lord. In um, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12, Hebrews chapter 3, we're reading from verse 12. Take heed, brethren, those who are born again, take heed, brethren. Those who are expecting the coming of the Lord, take heed, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Take heed that your mind is not swayed, drawn away from the Lord. Your heart is not strayed let us stray away from the Lord. Your concentration, your passion, your desire, your goal, your ambition does not stray away from the Lord. Concentrating on things here, on there. Take it, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the Lord. In verse 13, verse 13 says, but exhort one another daily. Husband and wife, what do you talk about? Do you ever talk about heaven? 
We are not talking about holiness. We are not talking about what qualifies us and preserves us for the rapture. Are you always talking on this, this, and that? And uh, this period now is like the mind of many people in the church is away from the coming king and is drawn to just politics, politics, politics. Wake up in the morning, check up politics. Sleep at night, wake, uh, check up politics. Talk together, check up politics. Your mind, prayer is going, going away from many believers. Politics is taking over. All the things of the world and the things many people think about and talk about now, but the Lord isn't taking. Lest your heart goes away from the Lord and exhort one another daily whilst it is called today. Lest any of you be hiding through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 14. In verse 14, it tells us, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end steadfast unto the end we're looking at first thessalonians chapter one we're reading from verse nine first thessalonians chapter one we're reading from verse nine for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God then verse 10 verse 10 to wait and to wait for his son you see those believers of the early church and the believers at Thessalonica you see what they did they came to the Lord they left all those idols they left all their Egypt they left all the corruption of the past and now they were steady, they were stable they were steadfast in following after the Lord and they were just waiting, every time they woke up in the morning they looked up he may come today and then in the night he may come in the night and their minds were always on the Lord because they want to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. That's what God expected of the children of Israel as they came out of Egypt. They, they were saying, how far now? How far now? How far now? The pleasant land. How far? The promised land. And that's what God wants for us. How soon? When will he come? When you see coming to take the bride and to take the brethren and to take the people of God, take them to heaven. These be Believers were doing the right thing, and they are an example, a model for us. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. In Second Peter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards words, not willing that any should perish. That's why Christ has not come. He does not want any sinner to perish. He wants sinners to be born again. He does not want any backslider to remain in backsliding and perish in backsliding. He does not want any carnal person using carnal weapons. He does not want that fellow to perish being carnal and totally giving to carnality. That's why he's still waiting. That's why I said the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards what not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Verse 10, in verse 10 it says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away 
with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Verse 11. In verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought she to be in all holy conversation and godliness? And then in verse 12, it says, Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Verse 13, it says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, Look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Verse 14, in verse 14, wherefore, beloved, seeing that all that ye look for such things be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. The diligent that was saved, and you keep the salvation. Be diligent that was sanctified, follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. Be diligent that you are holy and sanctified, so that that day will not come upon you. And I always be diligent that you will keep the power of the Holy Ghost in your life, so that everything the Lord has ordained that you will be, that you will do, and that you will do it for the glory of God, you will do it acceptably before the Lord. And as we're diligent one of these days, the Lord will come. And as he intended to take all the children of Israel to the promised land, to the pleasant land, he will come. He will take us to the perfect land, heaven, that's where we are going. We'll reach there. I will reach there. You will reach there in Jesus' name. Now you need to present yourself before the Lord and check up in your life. Have you strayed away? Have you strayed afar? Have you gone places you shouldn't have gone? Are you wandering about like in the wilderness? Or are you depending upon the Lord that he will hold you firm and steadfast and steady and he will hold you steadfast in the Lord so that when the Lord shall come, you will not be found missing in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and pray to the Lord that everything we have heard, the Lord will implant in us. Everything we have heard, the Lord will drill into us so that we remain, we abide steadfast in the Lord in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and pray, please. If uh, Pastor uh, Dr. Darius is there, please, we want you to come and lead us in prayer.